Well, welcome back to, I think this is the sixth presentation for the MSU Science Festival Digital Presentations. And I'm here with Dr. Zach Constan from the National Cyclotron Superconducting Laboratory. And I'm gonna have him give you a rundown of the supplies you'll need to do the demonstration along with him. So take it away, Zach. Thank you very much, Roxanne. Uh, today, we're gonna to be doing a very simple nuclear science experiment. With uh, household items, I will be using pennies and nickels. If you got pennies and nickels, that's great. Uh, you're going to need eight of each, but you could use pretty much any other household item you got that you have at least eight things of, two different kinds. I've also got, you know, Lego bricks. You got a few of those lying around. I've got plenty of very simple nuclear science experiment. Let's see, I got some of these beads. Red and blue. I've got different colors of M&Ms, right? Just don't eat them until we're done, okay? Or two different kinds of cereal. You got lots of, you know, so whatever. Just two different kinds of thing, eight of each, and we're going to model the nucleus with those. All right. So oh, thank you. One more thing, sorry. Oh. Paper plate. Paper plate. Awesome. awesome. So Zach, before we start your demonstration, can you tell us how you got interested in nuclear science, what your path was and what you find interesting about your job? Uh, sure, sure. So I got really excited about physics, um, you know, in high school when we started uh, breaking stuff and that was really great. Uh, I went to Michigan State University where it turns out we have the number one nuclear science program in the country, shocker. Yeah, it was no just green. We have. Yeah, I know, right? We're good at a lot of things. Farming, ice cream, but also nuclear science. So I work at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab. So it's this building in the middle of campus. It's between the Wharton Center and the dairy store. So you know, it's easy to find. <laughs> and it just happens to be one of the best places in the world to study rare isotopes. So, uh, you know, if you're at MSU, you should be a fan. If you're not at MSU, you can still be a fan of what we're doing. It's great. And so uh, I kind of lucked into it. And in my job, my current job is I'm the outreach coordinator, which means I literally brag about this laboratory to anybody who will listen. Today, that's you. Thank you. Awesome. And I would say for our audience out there at any time, if you have any questions, just write them in the comment section. We'll be looking at those and I will ask Zach questions as we go along throughout the demo. You bet. Uh, thanks very much, Roxanne. Okay. so. I spent a lot of time talking about nuclei, and, uh, and this is important, of course, because, you know, what's made of nuclei, well, you and your family and the earth and the sun and their nuclei everywhere, uh, because they're the center part of the atom. You might have heard of the atom, right? So the atom, there's atoms everywhere. They're really, really tiny. And the nucleus is the core of the atom. You know, it's, it's, it would took us a long time to realize the atom was made of smaller pieces, but the atom does have three smaller pieces. There are protons, I'm using pennies, makes a lot of sense. And there are neutrons, they form a nucleus, this core in the middle of an atom. So there you go. I've got two pennies, two, new, you know, two protons, two neutrons. That's a helium four. You can make a helium four if you want to. You know, helium four makes your, your voice go up. Do not inhale this, okay, that's not safe. Okay, but of course, that's just the nucleus. The atom is also made of electrons. Now, electrons, uh, we're not going to be talking about today. You could use dimes if you wanted to, but here's the deal. If, if the nucleus is here, then the electron is like a block away. So there you go. We don't need that electron. We're just going to deal with the nucleus today. So uh, the nucleus, protons and neutrons, like I said, they're different kinds of particles. And well, you know, the nucleus uh, is one kind of element. So you guys might have heard of elements you are made of a lot of carbon. Humans are carbon-based. All life, as far as we can tell, is carbon-based. And carbon nuclei uh, generally have, they always have, six protons. So I'm gonna use six pennies. Here we go, let's get these neutrons out of the way. Six pennies to make a carbon nucleus. Easy peasy, right? So this is what you're based on. It's got six, not pennies. Oh, important point. No matter what you've picked to represent protons and neutrons, they're made of protons and neutrons. Fun fact. So I've got a hydrogen, uh, sorry, I've sorry. got a carbon, that's six. We did uh, helium a minute ago, that was two protons. 
what makes it an element is how many protons does it have? So oxygen has eight protons in it. Gold has 79. It's just different numbers of protons. That's all an element is. And you guys might have seen this before, periodic table. Every element on this periodic table has a number. And right here, you probably can't see it. Carbon has six. Shocker. So six is the atomic number, and that just means six protons in the nucleus. So that's all it makes an element an element is how many protons are in that nucleus. Now, of course, the nucleus isn't just protons. There are also neutrons in there. So I've got a carbon, and now I'm going to add six neutrons to it. Nickels are neutrons. It just makes sense. So there you go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I have six protons, makes it carbon, and six neutrons. Okay, six plus six. Anybody? That's right, 12. Good job. I'm used to being able to hear you. It's okay. So uh, what we have here is 12 particles total. This is a carbon because it has six protons, and it has six neutrons, so it's carbon 12, six plus six. So the element is determined by number of protons. The isotope which is a variety of an element that we just use the name isotope, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So I've got carbon 12 here, because I got six and six. All right, let's do a little experiment. I bet you guys can do this with me. I want you to take whatever you're using for your protons and neutrons, whatever, you know, cereal, M&Ms, I don't care, something. I want you to take a random number of them and stick them together. Okay. I've taken a random number, and now we're going to identify what it is. And if you have a periodic table accessible, that's great. Otherwise, you know, we can we can look at this. It's pretty simple. Uh, what I've built here is a nucleus with three protons. Well, which element has the atomic number three? Lithium. So this is a lithium, which is you know just like what you find in your batteries, right? Lithium uh, is lithium-ion batteries. And so I know what element it is because of the number of protons. I've also added two neutrons on there. So three plus two is five. You got that. So I've got a lithium five here. You, so the point is you can name any nucleus you have. It's pretty simple. You count the protons, figure out what atomic number is that number. For me, three is lithium. For you, it could be whatever. I don't know. And then you add the number of neutrons and protons, and that's a number. So it's lithium five or, you know, carbon 12, which is six and six. So there you go. That's, that's how you name a nucleus. It's not just an element, you know, and this is, the periodic table is nice. This just doesn't have enough detail. No offense, chemists, you know, chemists are wonderful. I love them, but uh, this just doesn't have enough information. So in my laboratory, we use this instead. It's called the chart of the nuclides. And uh, these are really, really convenient. This particular chart only has the first eight elements. So one is hydrogen, two is helium, blah, 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 all the way up to oxygen. And so the number of protons determines your element. The number of neutrons determines your isotope. There you go. So no matter what combination you make, you can find out here, lithium-5, I made it, it's right here. Uh, Carbon-12, I mean, it's right here, you know? So this is a really, really nice way to look at your nuclei and tell what element and isotope it is. Of course, you can name it. So once you figured out what it is, you look on this chart and you, you see a lot of information that we're not really going to get into. What's important is some of these are stable. That's the black ones. And everything else is unstable and radioactive. That's the fun stuff. That's what we actually work on in my laboratory at MSU. So wonderful place, wonderful place. Uh, and you can name a nucleus that way. So here's the deal. Uh, the nucleus I've made here is unstable and radioactive. It's not a black square on this chart. So what does that mean? Well, an unstable nucleus basically has extra energy. A stable nucleus, uh, and that's what you're, you know, swimming in. They're everywhere. Look, there's some stable nuclei. You're stable nuclei, mostly. Uh, my microwave right there, you know, coming to you from my kitchen. Uh, yeah, that's stable, right, generally. So you have a lot of stable nuclei and they're very low energy comparatively. But the unstable nuclei, all these other colors here, they're radioactive. They have too much energy and they're radioactive and they're gonna shoot out a particle of some sort. So here's the deal. 
here's how the, uh, we're gonna use this plate right now. I want you to build uh, a beryllium eight. Beryllium eight has four protons because that's the atomic number of beryllium. Four protons and four neutrons. Four plus four is eight, you guys. So now I have a, a radioactive nucleus in my paper plate. It has too much energy, which means some particle is gonna shoot out at some point. So now I'm gonna give it too much energy and you guys can all do this. You have four of each on your plate and we're all gonna shake our plates a little bit, okay? Don't go crazy with your plate, okay? But see this, I'm just gonna start shaking it. Okay, actually, I, I went a little too far. Now all my particles are flying everywhere. But the point is, because of the extra energy in my nucleus, things came up. What, what is left? Uh, hydrogen two, it's something very different. Oh, I got one proton and one neutron. But that's honestly what's going on is these nuclei that are unstable, right? they're gonna shoot out a particle, it's gonna change the nucleus. And the goal of shooting out a particle and changing the nucleus is to make something that is stable, <laughs> that has lower energy. You're trying to get rid of the extra energy and end up with something that is stable and low energy and is happy because that's how our universe works. So the thing is, unstable isotopes, because they're unstable, eventually they're going to shoot out particles and they change. So you don't have them around for very long. In fact, you know, if you look around, right, we have almost no unstable isotopes existing, ooh, sorry, existing in our, you know, natural environment. There's some, there's some few, actually you have a few in your body. Let's see, we can build one right now. Go ahead and take six protons. That's a carbon. And we'll build carbon 12. So six protons, six neutrons. And that of course is what you're building based on. You've got lots of carbon 12 in your body. There you go, six and six carbon 12. Now, I'm going to take two, my two extra neutrons, because I had a couple left. I'm going to put them on there. This is not carbon 12 anymore. Is it still carbon? Yes. Still number of protons, six. But it's now it's carbon 14, six plus eight. You might have heard of carbon 14. It is in your body, and it's radioactive. But um, you don't have very much of it. You have some. This carbon 14 is unstable. All I did was change the number of neutrons. This is stable, this is unstable. Carbon 12, we got tons. Carbon uh, 14, not so much. So the unstable isotopes, we don't have very much of. So uh, at our laboratory, pretty much all we study is stable, sorry, unstable isotopes, radioactive, rare. You will literally not find them on this planet. So important question, how do we get them? <laughs> How do we study them if like, they're not lying around? We don't have any available. So now we're going to do my favorite experiment here, you guys. Um, in my laboratory, in the middle of Michigan State University, we take stable common nuclei, because we have lots of them. We accelerate them to nearly half the speed of light, and then we smash them very hard. There you go. That's your science for you guys. If you want to learn new things in science, you got to break stuff. <clears throat> True statement. True statement. So I have put together six protons and six neutrons. Here you go. You guys, I want you to get six protons, six neutrons in your hand. And Zach, if I can interrupt for a second, Please. since we've been going for a few minutes, can we um, recap what the protons and neutrons are as far as pennies and nickels in case people joined? Absolutely. We've got six. I'm using pennies for protons. You can assign whatever you want to protons. Just it makes sense to me because it's alliterative. Pennies are protons, nickels are neutrons. And I'm doing this because I had a lot of coins around the house. Thank Maybe you, you do too, it's, uh, it works out. But you can use whatever you want, I don't care. I have, I have Chex and Cheerios over here. It works just as well, that's fine. So I've got six protons, six neutrons in my hand. Uh, it's a stable nucleus, I have lots of them around. And now I'm gonna smash it. Now what I could do is throw it across the room, but um, I don't have to clean it up. So I'm gonna drop it on my plate. Here's my plate, right? And when I drop it from, I don't know, 18 inches or so, some of the pieces are gonna stay and they're whatever the, is left of the nucleus. And some of the pieces are gonna go flying. So I want you to take your carbon 12, six protons, six neutrons, whatever you're using, and drop it on your plate. And whatever's left on the plate is what's left of the nucleus. Okay. 
So, a couple pieces jumped off. What have I got left? Let's see. I've got five protons. There you go. Five protons. That is boron. I've literally changed the element. I started with carbon. I made boron. It's a totally different element. If you've ever heard of alchemy, that's what we do. Okay. So I broke the nucleus, changed from carbon to boron. How many uh, neutrons? Five. So five protons plus five neutrons. I made boron 10. Let's take a look at our chart here for a second. I started with carbon 12, which is stable. It's got a black square on it. I made boron 10. That is also stable and boring. Congratulations to me. Yep. So uh, I have not succeeded in making a rare radioactive isotope. Um, but now we're going to do it again. Because you know what we do in science? We do things multiple times. It's a true statement. I don't know if you've ever done experiments where they didn't work the first time. I don't know. It was a shocker to me too. But what we do in my laboratory is smash like a billion nuclei per second. And uh, if you do it a lot of times, you're going to get a lot of different results. I mean, let's think about it. Think about it for a second. If I do this again, if you do this again, are you going to get the same result? It's possible. You could, but it's actually kind of unlikely. So let's see what happens. All right. Got my carbon-12 again. You get your carbon-12. We're going to drop on the plates. We're going to see what happens. Maybe you get the same thing you got last time. Maybe you get something different. Let's find out. It's part of the fun. Holy cow. All right. Uh, ooh. Ah. Sometimes you get lucky, right? I have five protons. There you go. Five protons. That's boron again. I changed from carbon to boron. Now I have four neutrons. Five plus four, ah, there you go. Five plus four is nine. I made boron nine, let's take a look. Carbon 12, boron nine, it's got a yellow triangle there. Boron nine is so radioactive, it comes apart in less than a millionth of a billionth of a second. You will never find boron nine lying around on the planet, okay? Until we smash the nucleus and make it ourselves, you can't learn about boron 9. So that's what we try to do at my laboratory. We hit okay. the nucleus hard, make something new. We do have a question that Please. popped up. Where does the energy of the break go? Yeah, ah, yeah. I mean, we're hitting things pretty hard. It's true. And a lot of things are flying apart. So the, what we're trying to do, of course, is make something interesting. And the energy goes into breaking apart the nucleus, but like now all these parts go flying. Now, if I you know broke a lot of nuclei and I made some boron tens and some boron nines, I'm like, boy, I'm not interested in the boron tens. No offense. Then we would actually run it into a wall. <laughs> we actually steer just the interesting isotopes, the rare radioactive ones. We steer the ones we want off to the side where we're going to do a measurement. And we can talk about that. Uh, there's a lot of things we measure. But the stable or, or the ones that we don't want anyway end up hitting a wall uh, of concrete or possibly a uh, metal. Uh, and honestly, it just sticks there. And the thing is, right, it's, it's going super fast. It's hitting really hard. But we're talking about one nucleus. It's a teeny, teeny little thing. It doesn't do a lot of damage, okay? It's just not a lot of, you know. So the thing is, when people hear about accelerators and they see them on TV or in movies, they're like, oh, you turn it on. And like, oh, my gosh, all this stuff is flying. No. No, it doesn't sound or look very interesting. But you know, inside, it's interesting on the inside, which is great. I have a question from Wendy. Yeah. She's asking, what are the heaviest elements that you smash together? Ooh, good one. We smash all kinds. You know, pretty much we can we can smash any element you like, generally. But we the heaviest one we do is, of course, the heaviest one that exists naturally, which is uranium. We smash, we take a uranium nucleus that's pretty heavy compared to all these other ones. And we make it go pretty darn fast and hit it really hard. You might notice, right, to, to make the things we want, we basically break them down. We're knocking pieces off. So if I want to make something that's pretty heavy and, and radioactive and interesting, then I need to start with something that's heavier than that. So sometimes, it's not often, but we do, we smash uranium and we make something heavy and interesting. Uh, it's pretty hard on the equipment, but you can do it. We smash calcium more than anything. A whole lot of calcium. 
because we can actually get a lot more interesting nuclei pretty easily by smashing calcium 48. It's a long story, but it's kind of cool. Are you ready for another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, ASIP wants to know, where can you get the reference sheet? That sheet looks so cool. It is super cool. So what I have done is I have turned this activity and a couple of games into one document that you can download, uh, which I, I sent to uh, Catherine, and I should probably got it. Uh, but basically, uh, at the end here, I'm going to put up my email address. You can email me for it. But it should it should appear uh, on you know somewhere the Science Festival website or my website, uh, and you know it is it's just something that I've made. It's a lot easier to uh, you know identify your nucleus and then read more about what kinds of things it can do. Right, all these different color shapes, half lives, you know the the lifetime of the thing. Uh, there's a lot of things to learn, and so you know you can see I used to do this activity with marbles. Uh, but I know you're at home and maybe you don't have marbles. I don't know. So we're doing it with pennies now. And, and so we will get that on our website somewhere. Good. We'll, we'll make it available. And I have another question mm -hmm. I, from Alyssa. Her 10-year-old daughter has a question about, does the density of elements affect how fast they travel before hitting each other? Yes. So it is true that the heavier the element that we're trying to accelerate, uh, you know, it, basically, we can give all these new different nuclei about the same energy-ish, but the heavier they are, the slower they're going to go, essentially. Uh, just like if you took, you know, a, a penny and you threw it as hard as you could, uh, and then it would be going very, very fast, but it's very, very light, so the total energy is, you know, some amount. Now, I could also throw a bowling ball. I'm not going to do that. But if I threw a bowling ball, it wouldn't go nearly as fast as I could throw this penny, but it's got a lot more mass. So I took the, I put the same amount of energy-ish into it, but it's not going to go nearly as fast because I, you know, it was very heavy and hard to move very fast. So it's true, the heavier the, they are, the, the slower they're going. And we actually use that difference to be able to tell which one is which. You know, as the nuclei are flying through our accelerators at EFRIB at Michigan State, uh, you can time how fast they get from one place to another, and you can tell what element they are to some extent from that purpose. All right. One more question. Yeah, um, my Diane, her daughter has a question. She's got three protons and two neutrons. So she's wondering what that is. Okay. Three protons, two neutrons. So three protons is lithium, which is poisonous. Don't eat that. Not that you would. <laughs> Uh, three plus two is lithium five. This is a good one. Check this out. It's got a yellow triangle right there. Uh, that means it's super duper radioactive, which is good for you, right? That's what we wanted. Uh, this one comes apart in uh, God, less than a billionth of a billionth of a second. You're never going to find lithium five lying around. We don't have any. So nice one. Nice one. All and, right. So I was uh, telling you what we do at Michigan State at, at FRIB and NSCL. It's all there on the shirt, guys is we break the regular nuclei and we make hopefully something rare radioactive to study. Well, what can you learn about the nucleus? Well, my favorite thing, uh, I just love this. You, when you hear about nuclei, you know, you, you think about them being sort of round, you know, a circle. And that's, you know, pretty true in a lot of cases. So, you know, you can make a sort of circular nucleus. I'm doing that now. You can do it too if you want. There you go. So carbon-12, pretty circular. Nuclei don't have to be a sphere. They don't have to be round. Some nuclei are, no kidding, kind of pointy, like a football. Seriously? There you go. Football nucleus, obviously. Or, and this is the best, flat. Now, my nucleus is already flat because it's made of protons and neutrons. But I'm just going to make it like a line. Now, you guys, make a shape. Pick a shape, a weird shape for a nucleus. Arrange your protons and neutrons. Make something weird, okay? I want to hear about it. Uh, here's my flat nucleus. They, there are pancake-shaped nuclei. That's crazy. You don't hear about this, right? And I didn't know about it, but I had a PhD in physics. And I show up at this lab, and they're like, yeah, you can have a flat nucleus. Oh, okay. And that's the kind of stuff we measure. Now, how do you measure something you can't see? It's invisible, right? Well, um, 
I mean, if you, you can do this experiment later. If you have a brother or sister, uh, you can pretend they're invisible and you can measure what they look like by throwing things at them and watching it bounce off. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. But you get the idea. You can't see this flat thing, but you can chuck stuff at it or chuck it at stuff and, and watch how that stuff reacts. So we measure literally uh, the shape and size. This is, oh, this is the best one right here. So I'm going to make a lithium 11 that has three protons. Go ahead. You want three protons and you want eight neutrons. One of my neutrons has fallen on the floor. That's okay. I'll steal a neutron. Uh, there we go. Okay. Lithium 11. Three protons, eight neutrons. Right there. This is the coolest thing. When you think of nucleus, again, you think of all the particles kind of sticking together in a bunch. Lithium eight, sorry, lithium eleven is weird. It essentially is a bunch of protons and neutrons, but two of the neutrons hang out very far from the rest of the nucleus. So instead, now I've got a kind of like a lithium nine core, and then I got these neutrons. It's still lithium eleven. It's all together in one nucleus, but these neutrons are so far away from the rest of the particles. And that's so strange. And then my, my favorite thing about lithium-11 is that when you look at the size of it, right? If you measure the size, you're going to measure this size, not this size. You're going to measure the whole thing. And that's the same size as lead-208. Here are 208 protons and neutrons. This is the same size as lithium-11. What? That's crazy. That's, I love lithium ion. It's a wonderful particle for that reason. Uh, another thing we like to measure in our laboratory is like how many different how many different isotopes are possible. This just shows you the ones that are possible, essentially. And we know how you know how many are possible. We've discovered actually three thousand or so isotopes so far. According to some theories and some models, there might be as many as eight thousand possible isotopes. Now we've only ever discovered 3,000. There might be tons more that are undiscovered that nobody's ever seen. So what I've got here on my chart is, you know, I've got lithium 11. Lithium 10 is not on here. You can make something that's not on here. Uh, the easiest way really is to just put a bunch of protons together. Go ahead. Uh, now I have four protons together just by themselves. Well, what isotope is it? The element is, it's beryllium, number four. What isotope is it? Well, it's four plus zero, beryllium four. Well, let's look on this chart. Here we go. Uh, let's see, beryllium, there's beryllium eight, beryllium seven, beryllium six. Uh, nope, and nope. <laughs> so one of the things we're trying to learn at our laboratory is which ones are possible and which ones are impossible. And we don't know. We, we know a few. But there's, there's definitely a lot that we don't know that nobody's ever seen, but maybe it's just, no, we haven't done it right. We haven't tried hard enough yet. And we're very excited about being able to do that next. Let's see, there's a lot of, in fact, this the FRIB accelerator that we're building right now, uh, it's expected to discover at least a thousand new isotopes. That's a lot. Last time we discovered an isotope in our lab, we all got free pizza. It was a big day in the lab. So. Pretty excited about that. And uh, this is something that we kind of let off with. I told you the sun is made of nuclei. All stars are made of nuclei and they shine because they're sticking nuclei together. So here's the last little experiment for you. I want you to make three helium fours. A helium four is two protons, two neutrons. So you're going to make three groups near each other, but not right next to each other. So I'm making three helium fours. There we go. Three helium fours. So what stars do to shine is fusion, which is basically I'm taking little nuclei and jamming them together and I'm making something bigger. Well, there are stars out there that are taking three helium fours. And if things work just right, they all come together at the same time and they fuse, they stick together. If you push, your three helium fours together. Now count how many protons do you have? 
six. That's carbon. How many neutrons do you have? Six again, six plus six, carbon 12. I've already told you, you're made of carbon 12. Carbon 12 is very stable. Carbon 12 is all over the universe. And where is it coming from? Three helium fours fusing in a star. That's where your carbon was made. You are a star. I can't resist that, guys. It's really, it's important to me. So point is, fusion in a star. You want to learn how that works? You don't go to the star because it's not safe, okay? But you can study these nuclei and how they stick together and do their thing here on Earth. And that's what our laboratory is good for, right? In the middle of Michigan State, we have a place where you can study nuclei doing this kind of stuff. It's safer, it's cheaper, it's definitely a better idea. Trust me, okay? Uh, so that was the last experiment I have. I have uh, a little website if you want to visit it. There you go. Free information about what we do. Uh, if you want to learn more about nuclear science by playing our video game, it's called Isotopolis. You can play it on your phone or tablet. You can watch videos about our laboratory. You can take a virtual tour of our laboratory and you can email me. So there's the website, there's my email and I will answer questions until they tell me to stop. <laughs> All right, Zach, we do have a question from Amanda. She says, my kid wants to know how old he has to be before he can come study and work with you guys. Okay, oh, I like your opinion. I like what you're going for here. So here's the deal. Uh, people who work at our laboratory, so a lot of them are college students. So if, if you come to Michigan State, that's one of the reasons to do so, because you're at the place where the actual research is going on. So you can get involved as a college student. We have, let's see, 110, 120? I don't know, there's a lot of college students working in our laboratory. And that's one of the cool things. Now that said, if you're excited about this, now we can't give you a job before you're in college, sorry. But there are ways to get involved with this and, and learn more about it when you're much younger. We have camps. And that's another thing you can learn uh, from going to this website uh, and emailing me. We have camps. I have a high school camp. And then I also, there are some middle school and elementary school camps that actually give a, a nuclear astrophysics course to. So if you want to try more about this stuff, you want to learn more, you dabble in it, see if you like it. Uh, that's, that's the way I recommend. And we have tons of camps. Plus, of course, uh, when, you know, when it's safe, we're going to be giving tours in the laboratory. We got lots of opportunities for that. Uh, we want you to come visit us because it's important to us. We, we love what we do. We want you to be excited about it because uh, it's super important. It's something I haven't mentioned so far, the things that we learned in our lab, because we're studying how the nucleus works and everything's made of nuclei, the things we learn are going to become really, really useful. Honestly, they're going to save lives and change the world. So that's you know, if you haven't considered being a nuclear scientist yet, it's a good reason to do so. I just had one comment from Asip. Um, says his nine-year-old got a neon 11. Are you serious? That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, neon 11, of course, that's 10 protons and one neutron. That's, um, wow. <laughs> that's really hard. You know, in a real experiment in our laboratory, you want to try to make neon, neon 11. Good luck. Um, so you're obviously, uh, your kid is a natural. I'm just going to say it. There you go. That said, it might be easier to do it with protons and neutrons made of pennies and nickels, but yeah, what are you gonna do? You gotta start somewhere. And since you're both the NSCL and FRIB, what's the difference between oh, the two? Oh. So it's, it's complicated. The NSCL has been around a long time. We have cyclotrons, that's the C in, in, uh, in that. And cyclotrons are circular accelerators that make the nucleus go around in a, in a circle really fast. And when they come out, they bam. Okay, they hit. Our cyclotrons are some of the best in the world. We've been around for a long time, smashing nuclei. And we're top three in the world right now for that kind of research. Um, what's different about FRIB, hey, let's get that up there. What's different about FRIB, that's right there, is that we're replacing the cyclotrons, two of the best in the world, with a 400 yard long linear accelerator. It's folded a couple of times. 
And when the nuclei come out at the end of that thing, they're going even faster, so they get hit harder. And there's way more of them coming out every single second. If you want to make an interesting nucleus, uh, you know, you might not get it the first time. You might not get it the second time. You have to do it a bunch of times, and you get a lot of different results. Well, if you smash more, seriously, that's better. So uh, the cyclotrons don't do so much. I mean, it's, they do a lot, and they're doing wonderful research. But this new accelerator for Efrit is going to be so much more powerful, so many more nuclei. Uh, that we're going to be able to do experiments no one can do. We're going to have access to nuclei nobody's ever seen. We're going to discover ones off the map. And we're going to be the best in the world for this kind of research. I'm very, very excited about it, obviously. So keep, keep it in mind. Uh, it's not done yet. We're working on it. This new accelerator is scheduled to be online by 2022 at the latest. So uh, if any of our young viewers uh, might be graduating after that, well, if you come to Michigan State, you might be able to help us run this amazing world-class laboratory. And one last question. What would be a practical application you guys have discovered that we now can use in everyday life? You betcha. So the, the one that people generally know is medical imaging. X-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, PET scans. Those originated as nuclear detectors for measuring things like their size and shape and, and all the kinds of things that we are measuring. Uh, but it turns out because people are made of nuclei, we can measure your insides, which is not. There are ways, of course, to make power <laughs> with nuclear, uh, you know, the things we've learned. And smoke detectors use radioactive material. That's how they detect smoke. Airport security uses the same kind of detectors that we have. Sorry about that. I apologize. Uh, but there are a lot of applications. The uh, Honestly, you just, my favorite though, you can't build these electronics without the last 50 years of nuclear research. The things that we learned made this possible. Now, we weren't in the business of trying to make a phone. We're in the business of learning about rare nuclei, but the things that we learned made it possible. So um, that's really interesting is that our goal is to understand matter. How does it work? It's all made of nuclei. Like, what's going on with this checks right here? So, but the things that we learn become useful in ways really nobody saw coming. So it's totally, totally exciting. You look, you know, 30 years down the road, we're going to look back and say, oh, when we built Ephraim, and we started learning these things, that led us to these amazing discoveries that now we have all these amazing technologies. It's changed a lot of things. Wonderful things. So it's exciting. It is exciting. And with that, I think we'll leave it there. It was awesome to have you on for the Science Festival. We appreciate it. Thank and we you. will get those resources on our website. And thank you, Dr. Constan, for being with us today. Good seeing you. Stay safe. Do some science. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.